This presentation is on physical examination skills and clinical diagnosis for the cardiovascular system. Before proceeding with the clinical examination of this system, let us briefly review the anatomy and physiology. The heart is a double pumping chamber. The right atrium and ventricle are separated by the tricuspid valve. A semilunar valve is situated at the exit of the right ventricle leading onto the pulmonary trunk or artery. Blood from here goes on to supply the pulmonary circulation with deoxygenated blood. Oxygenated blood returning from the lungs to the left side of the heart first enters the left atrium. It is then pushed through the mitral valve into the powerful chambers of the left ventricle. Blood then leaves the left ventricle through the aortic semilunar valves. The systemic circulation is a high pressure system. The arteries have relatively thick muscular contractile walls which regulate blood flow. They can withstand high blood pressure and large vessels like the aorta also act as blood reservoirs. In comparison, the veins are thin-walled. Blood flow direction in the veins is dictated by small flap-like cusps which act as valves. These valves are found throughout the venous system. Another circulatory mechanism which works in close association with the cardiovascular system is the lymphatic system. Lymphatic fluid from the tissues and the gastrointestinal tract return to join the blood through the right and left thoracic ducts. These then join onto their respective subclavian veins. In terms of physiology or function of the heart, we can refer to intrinsic and extrinsic mechanisms as well as neural and hormonal control. The myocardium has an intrinsic autorhythmicity mechanism generated by specialized self-excitable muscle fibers. There are two neural nodes which function as pacemakers. The sinoatrial node is positioned on the top of the right atrium. Its function is to initiate an action potential which causes an impulse to propagate over both atria. Eventually, this impulse reaches the atrioventricular node. From the AV node, the impulse enters the atrioventricular bundle, or bundle of His, and then through a network of conducting fibers to the rest of the ventricles. The SA node has a rhythm of about 72 beats per minute, which is faster than the AV node, and it is therefore referred to as the pacemaker. In terms of extrinsic control mechanism, the heart rhythm and force is influenced by parasympathetic supply from the vagus nerve and by sympathetic fibers. The vagus nerve has a cardio-inhibitory effect on the pulse, whilst the sympathetic nervous system has a cardio-acceleratory effect. Heart rate and force is also influenced by circulating catecholamines, thyroxine, and by the concentration of ions, including sodium, potassium, and calcium. Blood pressure and tissue perfusion is influenced by neural and hormonal factors. Sympathetic stimulation causes vasoconstriction, especially in arterioles within the viscera and the skin. In contrast, sympathetic stimulation causes vasodilatation within skeletal muscles. Adrenaline and noradrenaline causes increased blood flow to the heart, liver and muscles. These hormones also influence heart rate and force. Blood pressure control and feedback is monitored by baroreceptors in the arch of the aorta and in the carotid sinuses. The level of blood oxygen and carbon dioxide concentration is monitored by chemoreceptors in the carotid and aortic bodies. These are located close to the baroreceptors. 
Feedback from these structures is processed in the cardiovascular center in the medulla oblongata. Receptors are also situated in the hypothalamus and in the kidneys. The renal system, adrenal and pituitary glands also have a profound effect on blood volume and blood pressure. A fall in blood volume and pressure triggers the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone mechanism to be activated. This leads to sodium retention and thus increases blood volume and blood pressure. A fall in blood pressure also causes secretion of antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary. Antidiuretic hormone causes reduced urine output, decreased perspiration and arterial constriction. Having revised some key points in the anatomy and physiology of the cardiovascular system, let us now proceed with the clinical examination. Although this examination is focused into the assessment of the cardiovascular system, remember that in real life you will not be operating within such a rigid framework. In a real situation, a patient is not just given a cardiovascular assessment. You must first perform what we described in the relevant video, a general examination, before you focus your assessment into the particular system. The other thing to note is that in a real situation, when carrying out a clinical examination, you do not perform, say, general examination first, and when you have finished, you start to examine a specific system. This approach will cause duplication in maneuvers, and it is tiring for the patient. In a real situation, you will integrate several elements of the general examination with the cardiovascular assessment. For instance, in doing a general examination, you include inspection of the hands. A cardiovascular examination also includes inspection of the hands. You will therefore integrate the details of hand inspection from both procedures in one single approach. Like all other systems, examination should always begin with an assessment of the general appearance of the patient. By this stage, you should have formulated an overall impression of the patient's state of health. This is done throughout your encounter with the patient, from the moment they enter your practice, through your case history taken, and from the general examination procedure. It helps to memorize the procedure as four distinct steps observation or inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. The patient should undress preferably down to their underwear. Then observe the patient for a few moments for evidence of breathlessness, pain, or discomfort. <laughs>